Hello, this is Community Unity Now. I am Trudy Leong, Administrator of the Rogers Park Chamber of Commerce. My co-host is Bill Morton. He is the President of the Rogers Park Chamber of Commerce. Our very special guest today is Mr. Michael Zink. He is running for the 20th Sub-Circuit Court of Cook County. Welcome, Michael. Thank you for having me, Trudy. Okay, so uh, what does the 20th Sub-Circuit Court of Cook County cover? So uh, it covers the Gold Coast area, beginning about Chestnut Street. Um, it goes north along the lakefront, uh, all the way up to Devon, just short of Rogers Park. Mm -hmm. And then uh, to the west, it goes along uh, Ashland and then Clark. Um, and only goes really far as far west as uh, maybe Lincoln Avenue uh, in certain areas. So it's primarily along the lakefront uh, on the north side of the city, uh, just north of the Gold Coast. Mm, okay. And uh, uh, and wh how? Um, why why did you run for judge? You were very active in uh, the community. So uh, what what were you doing that uh, made you want to run for judge? You were also you're you're also a practicing lawyer. I am. Uh, public service is the number one reason why I'm running. Uh, I've been very active publicly in my community in a whole variety of different roles. And I've uh, known quite a few people who've gone on to serve as judges and uh, all of their uh, goals and their objectives were exactly the same. They wanted to do and commit to public service. And uh, that's been my goal throughout this whole process. It's been uh, very meaningful uh, work that I've done in the community. And I think uh, serving as a judge and especially applying my abilities as an attorney uh, would, would work very well together and they, they really gel. Mm -hmm. Is this your first time running? It is my first time, yes. And uh, how many signatures did you need to get? Well, officially, you only needed to get 1,000 signatures to get on the ballot. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, uh, just to avoid any kind of uh, opposition or objections, uh, you want to get about three times. And so I've uh, fortunately, uh, in my entire uh, race, I was the one with the most signatures, over 3,300 signatures. Um, and so uh, fortunately, we did not, did not have any challenges and uh, I was able to make it on the ballot. Mm -hmm. Congratulations on that. Yes. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, that saves a lot of time and headache. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Okay, uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, you were a member, you are or were a member of the Advocates Society. Uh, how do you serve your community as a member of the Advocates Society? Sure, well, the Advocates Society is uh, the uh, Bar Association for Polish American Attorneys. It's been around almost 100 years now. Um, and I've, uh, my grandfather actually was uh, part of it back in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. Mm -hmm. So that's how I heard of it even growing up. And then um, I became a uh, member about tw almost 20 years ago and eventually uh, made my way to become an officer. I was nominated to become an officer and worked my way up and eventually became president in 2015. Um, the presidential years are only one year long. And so during my year, what I did was I reached out to a whole bunch of other cultural bar associations and we initiated these exchanges. So what we did was a group of our members in the Advocate Society would go to various meetings of these other cultural bar associations, such as the Cook County Bar Association, uh, which is the nation's uh, oldest African-American bar association uh, lesbian Gay Bar Association, the Decalogue Society, and a whole variety of others. And so for the year, we would have groups of our delegations go to their, uh, attend one of their meetings so that we could all get together and meet each other. And then later in the year, uh, they would come back and attend some, one of our meetings. And so it was very meaningful. And to this, to this day, I've been uh, very good friends with a number of the presidents that I worked with in that capacity. Um, and then along the way, too, I, after I became, after I was done being president, I still served on the board um, and I served on the steering committee. Steering committee means that you basically uh, review people who are running for judge. Typically, uh, anybody who reaches out and wants to get some kind of a, a recommendation from the organization when they're running for office, especially for judge. And so I did that for quite a few years uh, while I was, uh, even as a, an ex-president, um, just continuing to you know remain, remain involved and uh, to really keep the uh, organization vibrant. So uh, you have to um, uh find the background, uh, all the backgrounds of those uh, that are running for judge, and then interview them as well. Well, the way that the process worked there is uh, you would put word out publicly through various media in, in the legal community and, and tell everybody, we are looking for people who are interested in being recommended mm -hmm. by the Advocate Society. Mm -hmm. And then we would get all their credentials and go through them. Uh, typically, you get you know multiple dozens of them, and you have to go through them with our steering committee. And then our board actually reviews them as well. And uh, everybody comes to a decision, uh, you know, consensus on each individual uh, candidate uh, as to far as their credentials um, to determine whether they're uh, recommended for office or not. 
So I guess uh, after all those years working at uh, uh, on the steering committee, you understand very well what credentials are necessary, and uh, now you see yourself that uh, you have those credentials, and it's uh, it's time to run. Yeah, I, I, now I'm the I'm on the other side of the uh, fence, exactly. Uh, and I even did the same. I served in the same capacity with the Illinois State Bar Association for about six years in reviewing credentials of candidates and vetting them uh, who are running for judge. And so now I'm on the other side, and so um, it was uh, somewhat nerve wracking sometimes. But uh, fortunately, every bar association that's reviewed me as it found me either recommended or uh, qualified, uh, which is uh, wonderful. And uh, I'm uh, grateful that for all the uh, work that all those committees put in. It is a great deal of work, uh, especially uh, the uh, what they call the alliance. The alliance is all the various cultural bar associations, and they each have their own committee that does this together. And uh, they all have to individually do these uh, recommendations or qualifications and see who they recommend. So it is a tremendous amount of work to do the interviews. It's a tremendous amount of work just to do the uh, review of these the various uh, candidates because oftentimes it can uh, number in over a hundred. So you have a, you have a real knowledge about the process. Yeah, the I've been, it's a, it's a, it's, an, it's, an, it's, an, it's a very a meticulous process. It's a very detailed process, but it's an important process because I think a lot of judicial candidates, um, the public simply doesn't know. Uh, you know, you, you walk into a uh, you know ballot and you see all those names on the screen, that's why it's important to be able to you know, look them up online or to you know, go to the various bar associations, see what the alliance determined about these various candidates. Are they qualified or recommended by the various organizations? Bill and I are election judges, and we hear from the voters all the time that they just give up on the, the ballot, the side of the judges, and that's so sad. Oh. Yeah. However, I did want to ask you, uh, when uh, the uh, various candidates uh, get uh, vetted by the various bar associations, uh, do uh, some of them uh, have different recommendations uh, among the bar associations? Like maybe some are ranked higher in some bar associations uh, uh, versus others, or are they usually very uniform? Um, they're often uniform, but not always. Uh, every bar association does their own vetting. So uh, even if they've uh, seen the interview, even if they've looked at all the qualifications, they may come to different conclusions. And even even when they find a candidate qualified, some of the organizations have a designation such as highly qualified. Um, and so those are uh, for you know candidates that are particularly experienced. Uh, oftentimes, those are uh, candidates who are running for, for example, appellate court uh, or supreme court. But um, the even though the the finding may not be uniform. Um, many times they are, but every organization does their own vetting and has their own determinations about how they do it. And when you were uh, having those meetings with the various different bar associations, uh, uh, were the issues that uh, the various bar associations uh, uh, were, that they were concerned about, uh, did they differ from one, one another so that uh, you were able to learn from one another from the different bar associations? And how does that help you now? Uh, with, uh, with running for judge and maybe serving as a judge? Well, the, most of the criteria for all the bar associations is generally the same. They want to see your uh, credentials to see if you've done a lot of litigation work, because obviously as a judge you're going to be doing litigation. Mm -hmm. But they also want to see you know, uh, your uh, characteristics of are you going to be fair and impartial or uh, what kind of uh, temperament do you have, those kind of issues. And those are very important because every judge is going to have you know, different qualifications for each of those different criteria. Mm -hmm. And so I think every organization uses those same criteria, um, but they, they look at them in, uh, in their own way in terms of reviewing what their credentials say uh, in front of them, and also to see that candidate. That's why it's important to have a, an actual interview with the candidate, mm -hmm. because you can see, you can tell a lot from a person just by talking to them, um, you know, as mm -hmm. opposed to just merely looking at a piece of paper. Absolutely. So well, did they have the endorsement sessions? Uh, well, these are not endorsements by the bar associations. Mm -hmm. These are just bar ratings. Um, but there are endorsements from generally elected officials and other organizations. Mm -hmm. Those are separate from the, what the bar associations do. Fortunately, in my case, I've been endorsed by just about every uh, prominent elected official in the entire 20th sub-circuit, uh, from our members of Congress all the way to our uh, committee people. I think the number is a total of about 16 individuals, um, which is a little bit unusual because usually if the county is getting involved in endorsements, they just say the county endorses you. Mm -hmm. This race didn't open up until October, the county was already done endorsing by that point. And so um, as a result, it's it's very meaningful and, and I'm very humbled that I've gotten that much support. And likewise, I've been supported by various other organizations, uh, Personal PAC, um, the uh, Chicago Federation of Labor, uh, IBEW 134, uh, every IVI IPO, the Coalition PAC. So all these different groups all, all weigh in. They're, they're, those are endorsements uh, versus what the bar associations do, which are actually 
essentially just uh, r ratings to see is this person qualified uh, to be on the bench. Uh, you uh, mentioned that um, uh, I, I think on your website that you uh, uh, want uh, elected officials to foster a more transparent and accountable system of government. So uh, if, uh, you know, as a judge, uh, how would you be able to move this issue forward? Well, I think in terms of uh, elected officials uh, being transparent, first of all, that begin that's a role that I've taken in my own community uh, as president of East Lakeview Neighbors. Uh, it's one of the largest neighborhood organizations in all of Lakeview. And uh, one of the roles that I undertook in doing that was to com communicate with our organization between and, and among the various elected officials. Mm. Um, and I think it, it's really uh, paid dividends. I think our community realizes how accessible uh, so many of our elected officials are um, and how our elected officials are willing to work with them on various issues. Um, it's really opened up a lot of avenues. Um, and being on the bench, although you wouldn't have necessarily a role in doing any of that because you're actually just hearing individual cases before you, um, there is a serious uh, overlap there in terms of you know uh, communicating among people, getting people in touch. So, for example, uh, when I was on the East, Lake, East Lakeview Neighbors as president, um, we would often have some contentious matters that would get a little bit heated uh, in mm -hmm. the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, there's a there is a role and there's a skill in terms of trying to be respectful and keep it uncensored, but at the same time, keep some order, keep everybody uh, on the same page and understand we may disagree on things, but we're still all neighbors. We're still all going to get together. Those all serve very well on the bench. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think yes. a good judge is able to see a courtroom, and sometimes you will have individuals, you'll have lawyers who get a little hot under the collar. You'll even have self-represented litigants who may get a little bit uh, uh, angry about things. Mm -hmm. It's important to stay calm. It's important to keep everybody focused. Uh, and I think those are all skills that I've been able to develop over the years just in my, com in my community work. Uh, what were the uh, issues that uh, came to the forefront of uh, of so your organization, your neighborhood uh, organization, Lakeville? Uh, and then, um, uh, how how does uh, your work on that affect uh, affect your work, uh, your future work as a judge? So, well, officially, I, I'm no longer on the East Lake Green Neighbors mm -hmm. Board. Uh, pursuant to our bylaws, candidates are not allowed to run, and that's a very smart uh, mm -hmm. uh, bylaw to have. Yes. Um, but nevertheless, I'm still involved with the organization, uh, not just not in the board capacity. But, for example, uh, it's, it's, it's Lakeview, and it's actually right by Wrigley Field. So uh, we've had um, a number of matters over the years that the Chicago Cubs uh, wanted to take some per particular actions in the community. They work with the community, and the work community gives their feedback. Likewise, the older people uh, get involved and uh, act and hear out the community. Almost the community becomes a sounding board to and from uh, the, both the Cubs as well as various developers, people who want to do various projects in the community. The community is all there to hear these things out, to put their input, and to pro provide their input. And then ultimately, the East Lake Neighbor Board uh, goes to the older person and says, this is our recommendation. Um, similarly, another uh, matters that were coming up in recent years uh, were matters of crime. Um, you I think there was a lot of confusion about the you know the new laws, um, and if there was crime in the community, sometimes people would really be upset. And so one of the things I did was uh, help facilitate uh, forums, as opposed to just setting up a forum where everybody could just yell at each other and point and blame people. What we what I did and, and my talented board worked with me on is setting up forums. So we did a forum on the Safety Act, uh, and we brought all the stakeholders together: the uh, public defenders, prosecutors, police, uh, community activists, CAPS members. Um, get everybody involved so they can explain what this is and what it's like. And we even had our elected officials on there as well. Uh, some of them were in the process of actually, you know, uh, passing that law in the, in the process. And we did the same thing for um, just simple as, for example, what happens when somebody's arrested? What is that process like? And what happens to that person? And we did various other things. We did one uh, last, I think, in the last three or four months about COPA, about what happens with uh, police uh, uh, misconduct and police discipline. So all those things, you know, we want to in include the community and we want the community to be engaged and educated about what this all means as opposed to just jumping the gun and you know acting acting out you know because again it's the whole overall overriding theme is we're all in the community together let's let's figure this out let's learn about it together you also mentioned uh, that there is implicit bias uh, rooted in our judicial system and uh, how can you address that bias as a judge well, actually, the, a judge has significant power to start overcoming that implicit bias uh, from their role on the bench. Mm -hmm. um, implicit bias is something we all have. Um, it's basically a bias that you, you know, first of all, you have to acknowledge. Um, and 
you know, we all have it in one sense or another. So I think, first of all, the step one with any judge is hearing every case out. So what does that mean? It means if there's a self-represented litigant in front of you, you don't interrupt the person or you don't, you don't talk over them, you know, make them think that what they're saying is irrelevant or, or unimportant. Mm -hmm. Hear them out. Uh, that's the first thing. Um, it, it's also important that that not only helps the actual adjudication of justice, but when that person goes back to their community, their family, their friends, they're going to say, I had my fair day in court. That's one of the things that a judge has a very important power to do is um, not only impact justice itself, but the impression of justice. Because many people who are in court are only going to be in court maybe one time in their life, uh, you know, maybe no more than once or twice. So what happens to what that judge says and does in front of that person and in front of the whole courtroom really has a, a significant impact. And, in, and likewise, you have to think about the, other, the next step after not only merely, you know, hearing the person out, Think about what that person's, you know, where, where they've been. You know, you'll hear it as they talk to you. You'll, you'll they'll, that person, or they, uh, they'll hear, they'll, they'll explain some things about their background, and you'll understand where they're coming from a little bit more, as opposed to just jumping to conclusions or making implications that probably aren't really fair. When you think about those things, when you do that in every single case, and I know every judicial candidate says, I'm going to think of every case, you know, separately, and I'm going to consider the facts in every case separately. That's wonderful, but that's only this first step. The next step is to actually put it into a perspective and as a judge to think about how does this law apply to that and what would be a fair way to apply this law to that particular set of facts. Do you have to address uh, implicit bias as an attorney as well? You do. I mean, uh, on a, for every client you represent, uh, you have to you know, check your ego at the door. You have to hear them out. Um, you can steer people in the right direction, but you can do it respectfully if they start talking about something that may be a little bit of field from what, you're, what your uh, case is about. Mm -hmm. But you want to hear them out because, again, it, it not only, again, is going to be something that's going you know, to help the, uh, the impression, the, you know, the uh, perception of justice when that person goes back to their home. But on, on top of that, you, you want that client to understand you care about what they're doing, you care about that case, and you care about them, you know, uh, getting their day in court and, and having justice prevail. And uh, what about uh, in the future, like uh, if you run for another judge, judgeship or, or run for retention, I don't know how long uh, that when that would be, you know, if, if after you win this election, uh, you do you also uh, get reviewed again. And then uh, uh, how you address uh, implicit bias, uh, uh, as a as a judge would be uh, taken into consideration. Do they also go back in the past about how you addressed uh, implicit bias as an attorney? Do how deep do they go uh, trying to review you uh, for uh, a future election? I say uh, it. It ultimately depends. Um, you, as you said, their uh, retention is six years. So if, six if whoever years. wins this election will be on the bench for six years, mm -hmm. and then they're going to have to run for retention. Um, and that's uh, that. As you said, that's another process. That's another uh, process that the various bar associations go through to vet the various judges. And to your point about you know whether it's implicit bias or any other uh, concerning things in a, in a judge's background, yes, the associations they look into that. Uh, you know, they especially what happens is uh, the associations interview a lot of people for every judge, even the judges who are running for retention. And so what happens is they will interview a lot of people, not just lawyers who are in front of that judge, but even self-represented litigants, uh, even people who uh, are what they call off-list, meaning they, they may not have been provided by those judges in their credentials. Um, the, the investigation is thorough, um, it is strong, and, and it will typically catch up on, uh, you know, if a judge has expressed some kind of implicit bias or otherwise, you know, uh, articulated something that may not have been just, it, it will usually come up. Mm -hmm. And when uh, people in the courtroom, uh, do they, you know, during those trials, uh, be it uh, maybe a spectator or whoever was affected by that that trial, uh, do they are they do they file complaints too? If there is a complaint to file, if they're, if they're unhappy, do they file complaints? Oh yes, anybody can file a complaint for any uh, any reason that they perceive to be you know some kind of a violation mm -hmm. that the judge may have committed. Uh, that's through the what's the, called the Judicial Inquiry Board, oh. um, and there's a there's a whole procedure in terms of that investigation com, com conducted by that board. But yes, anybody can even even spectators in the in the crowd who may not even be a litigant in front of that particular judge, mm -hmm. they absolutely can make those kind of uh, requests and inquiries uh, to see if some wrongdoing was done. Mm -hmm. You really have to uh, love your work in order to you know be so immersed in it because there is so so many moving parts. I, I think every every lawyer and every judge, to one extent or another, um, it, it's a vocation. You know, one way or the other, you should see yourself as a leader. You should you know conduct yourself as a leader um, to understand you're there to help people. You're 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 not there for yourself. You're there for others. Mm -hmm. 
Well, uh, speaking of helping people, uh, you uh, help prepare meals uh, for the homeless uh, at the Lincoln Park Community Services. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, do you still have time for that? Your work is very busy and uh, it has you running around and then now the election. <laughs> campaign so uh do you, are you still able to do that i am and uh, in fact i just was there about a week and a half ago lincoln park community services has just done a tremendous job for almost 40 years now i think mm -hmm. um and uh, essentially what it is is a whole group of churches uh in the lincoln park community got together of different dom denominations and they saw that there was a need there and so uh now uh, various churches undertake this um, and it's a it's a remarkable program. It not only uh, helps the homeless in terms of you know getting meals for them and letting them sleep overnight, um, but the whole goal of the program is to get these individuals back on their feet and uh, self sufficient. And so what they do there is um, not only do they have you know long long term uh, if necessary they can stay there long term, um, but they have social workers who help with the, whether it be addiction problems uh, or, or any other issues they have or mental health. Um, similarly, they have uh, uh, assistants and, and volunteers come in to help uh, the residents through their resumes. They have computer lab um, and they help everybody. And the whole goal is to get these individuals um, back in their own apartment. And, uh, and after they, after they uh, get into that apartment, oftentimes they come back and visit their old friends there. Um, they're called graduates at that point. Uh, the, the program is remarkable and has is, and is really turned around countless lives over the last 40 years. It sounds like the housing first model. And, and just real quickly, how did you start with that organization in particular? For Lincoln Park Community Services, I got involved through my church at St. Clement Church, um, and they've been involved. They were actually almost the nucleus of the program back almost 40 years ago. And so I've been doing this now almost 20 years, uh, and it is just remarkable. You get to see, you know, so many people. And one of the great things about it, too, that uh, a lot of the churches have is, you know, it's a, it's a good problem to have. They have a lot of people willing to volunteer. I know St. Clement mm -hmm. has waiting lists for these lists mm -hmm. of people waiting to come in and, and wanting to, you know, come and uh, coordinate these meals. And so what you do is, you know, as the organizer, you, you, know, you get the meal together and you send the email out to all the various uh, volunteers. Say, all right, everybody, bring your ingredients, and mm -hmm. uh, and and it's just a fun, fun time. You know, we've we've had kids, you know, from the ages of probably grade school uh, all the way through uh, in their seventies and eighties. Um, we have a lot of lot of uh, people in their twenties and thirties who come and volunteer. It, it's just a, a remarkable and meaningful experience every time. Well, as a as a judge, uh, what what would you uh, say that? Uh, is there anything in the system that, that that's not functioning as well as it could? And then uh, do you have any, uh, can you speak about that? Uh, I think every every system can can uh, be improved one way or the other. I think one of the things that uh, our judges in, in Cook County have now started to uh, work on is getting everybody back in person as much as possible, but also realizing you don't always have to have everybody in person. So generally that model, and I think it's still gradually, uh, gradually developing, but um, for example, if it's not really going to be a hearing on a, a significant matter, or, such as a motion for summary judgment or a motion to dismiss, or even a trial for that matter, those, those kind of significant hearings hearings definitely need to be in person. Uh, a judge needs to be able to hear evidence. It also avoids any kind of technical problems. But at the same time, you know, if it's just up for a status, if the case is just up for a routine status of discovery, you know, where are we at discovery, you know, in terms of uh, providing, you know, each party. Uh, the judge can handle that typically by Zoom. You don't have to have everybody run downtown. It also saves clients some money because obviously lawyers often built by the hour. If you, if you can go on Zoom and save yourself that trip, it saves uh, you know your clients some money as well, and, and they certainly appreciate that. And maybe you don't have to take off work. Exactly, and it allows you to be in multiple places at once. I think every lawyer's had a, an experience of being in two or three different counties at once. I know I have, um, so it's a, it's an interesting experience. But I think the judges appreciate that too because they can move their court court call along a lot better. Um, you know, especially if it's just something routine that's not requiring a, some kind of a hearing or a trial. Mm -hmm. We heard some uh, talk, just a quick question. Um, uh, we heard some talk about the scheduling system, uh, the online scheduling system. How, how, how is it working for you when you schedule hearings? Uh, it's it's good. I mean, it, uh, largely Cook County has gone into a uh, computerized uh, system, and so you you have to get whatever date the system gives you unless you have an emergency motion. Um, but no, by and large, I think the administrators have done a good job. Uh, at the beginning of Zoom, it, at the beginning of COVID, it was a little bit more difficult, but they've done a nice job adjusting. Okay, Michael Zink, if our viewers want to learn more about you, where should they go? Uh, well, I have a website at uh, zinkforjudge.com. Uh, 
And uh, there you'll see also all things about my background, the various bar ratings I have, uh, various levels of support, um, and uh, certainly any uh, contact information if you have any questions that you want to ask me. And uh, do you have any other uh, public forums coming up where uh, maybe our uh, viewers would uh, be able to meet you in person? Well, we're in the process of doing that. In fact, that's probably uh, very helpful for the website uh, to go to the website because we can keep you informed there. Uh, uh, we will have probably one or more, one or two more forums before the election. The election is three weeks from today, so uh, I think the, the uh, vote by mail ballots are going out very soon. And so it's important for everybody to start uh, learning about the various judges and, and uh, who they want to support. Support. Thank you so much, Michael Singh, for joining us on Community Unity Now, the D Tycoon Show. My name is Trudy Leong, Administrator of the Rogers Park Chamber of Commerce, and this is my co-host, uh, Bill Morton, President of the Rogers Park Chamber of Commerce. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you next week.